Okay. These people gave me a really weird look with my cowboy hat. Hello, neighbors. Here in the UK, not a thing. Scratch it all. Those don't exist. Welcome back to the Girl Gun London channel. If you're new here, my name is Kaylin. I'm an American who's lived in the UK for almost 10 years. And today I'm doing another edition of less commonly known differences between the UK and the US. Now I'm wearing this cowboy hat for no real reason whatsoever, but I thought it would make a cute thumbnail. Um, so maybe I'll leave it on. People are walking by my window. I'll wave to them. They'll be like, who's that weird American who lives in my street? Now, please remember that if you like this video, hit like and hit subscribe. It helps tell YouTube that you enjoy this kind of video and that you'd like to see more of them. And it helps me out because it tells YouTube that I'm doing something worth watching. If you don't think it's worth watching, either leave a hate comment so that you can be involved in a future reacting to hate comments video or just click off. And in response to one of the differences that I am going to get into, today's question in this video that I love for you to answer down below is, where are you from and what time do you eat dinner? It will make a lot more sense in a couple minutes. So this isn't on my list, but it is a prop, but I would say that they don't really wear cowboy hats in the UK, so maybe that can actually be my first difference. Okay, so my next difference has to do with what we would call in the US as summer break. Maybe they would call it like, they call it school holidays here. So basically the time that kids get off from school. And in the US, we have pretty long summers. So I would get out of school like mid-May and well, in Florida, we would go back kind of August time, but it was still a solid two months, if not more. And particularly when I was in college slash university, we definitely had a like full three month long summer between years. Now here in the UK, the school holidays or the summer break really last like approximately six weeks. And this is because throughout the school year, they get off more time. So they have more breaks in between than we do in the States. Um, and so that gives them a shorter summer. I think as a kid, I would have definitely preferred the longer summer. Some people say here, well, you don't get bored. It's like just enough time for the parents not to go crazy. But there was something about an American summer and how long it was that really felt, I don't know, full of possibility. I feel like six weeks is by the time you've actually figured out what you're doing for six weeks, it's already over. Whereas when you have a couple months plus up to three months, um, yes, you could forget a lot of what you learned the last year, but they would give us like summer reading and summer activities to do. And I don't know, it just felt like there was more that you could squeeze into a summer. Again, they do have about the same amount of time off here throughout the year. It's just spread out a little bit differently. Okay, so my next difference is about eating times. So Americans tend to eat a breakfast at whatever time you wake up. Lunch is typically going to be like noon, possibly even earlier. Like you could do an 1130 could be lunch. Um, but really noon is what we consider lunchtime culturally. And dinner for an American is going to be in my experience, closer to like five to six. Once you're stretching into the like seven, 8 p.m., that's pretty late to an American. Whereas in the UK, you eat breakfast whenever you get up. Lunch is really considered starting at like one o'clock, I would say. Um, we would wait in my old office. Well, they would wait, I would eat whenever. Um, but the Brits in my office would wait until it was like 12.30 and they couldn't eat before that just out of principle um, where I had already eaten like lunch one and two before noon. But yeah, so that means that dinner, typically a dinner time is gonna be like seven, 7.30. You know, eight o'clock is a perfectly acceptable time to have dinner or to make dinner reservations. By the time you're pushing like 8.30 or nine, that is still relatively late for dinner here. Um, I think if you took a poll of everyone's eating times, but it's not like unheard of. Okay. These people gave me a really weird look with my cowboy hat. Hello neighbors. Um, so I was really shocked when I came here about the differences between what we consider is an acceptable eating time because we wouldn't sit down to eat with my husband's parents when we went over to dinner until like 7.30. And as an American, I was like, I was hungry three hours ago. 
And so it's just a little bit of a difference there in what eating times we consider acceptable. My next difference is a short one, but here in the UK, they call it the hokey cokey. In the US, we call it the hokey pokey. Um, I'm not sure if the lyrics are different. I'll look it up and I'll put the answer here. Um, but it is definitely not called the hokey pokey here. So if you ever hear hokey cokey as an American in the UK, they're basically referring to the hokey pokey. Okay, the next one really hurts my heart to say, but PB and J, peanut butter jelly, classic American sandwich. Everyone had it in their lunch growing up, except for me because I don't like jelly. So I just had the P out of the PB and J. Um, not a thing in the UK. They usually think it's really weird. You're never gonna find someone offering you one. The kids are not gonna eat it at school. PB and J is a very American concept and they have not gotten on board with it. And definitely I've gotten some uh, interesting looks when explaining what a PB and J is. I think a PB and J is a perfectly good idea and considering they put French fries on sandwiches here and call that a meal, I feel like there can be no judgment across the pond. But if you are obsessed with PB and J, you can buy peanut butter, you can buy jelly, um, which is actually called something different in the UK, but that's for another video. Um, you can buy the jam or the jelly and the peanut butter and the bread. So you can make your own, but you're not gonna like find it anywhere. Okay, the next difference has to do with college or university entrance exams. And again, they are two different systems, which I will talk about in another video, but you should not expect in the UK SATs, AP classes, and what's the other one that we do that starts with an A? Does it start with an A? Oh, shoot. You know what I'm talking about. It goes up to like 36. Uh, what's it called? SATs or, I don't know, hang on. Oh, the ACT. Okay, so in the US, we have the SAT and the ACT, where they're both college entrance, entrance exams. And we have AP tests, advanced placement tests, which correlate to a class that you took in high school. And this is a way of testing out of college credit. And sometimes colleges do look at them to help you, help them decide whether you're going to be accepted to the university. Here in the UK, not a thing, scratch it all. Those don't exist. If they were applying obviously for school elsewhere in the world that required that as an entrance exam, there are places I think in the UK that you can test for the SATs and things like that, but their entrance exams are their A levels. And they also have tests called GCSEs and these are tests that they take in their version of high school, secondary school. Um, and they are used in terms of college placement and figuring out where you're accepted and you have to get certain scores, but they correlate really to specific subjects like the AP classes. This standardized test of an SAT or an ACT to get into university doesn't exist in the UK. As far as I'm aware, if anyone knows different, let me know down below. So moving on to some other less commonly known differences, let's talk about how most Americans only know how to drive an automatic transmission and we are very unfamiliar with what we would call stick shift or a manual transmission. Obviously some people do drive it, but most of us don't grow up learning it because it honestly just seems like a lot of extra work in order to get a car to go. And we are not a fan of like extra work as an American if we can find a more convenient way to do it. Here in the UK, they mostly drive what they call manual cars, stick shift. And so they are always shifting gears to go anywhere. You can purchase and drive an automatic car in the UK. It is becoming more common. I feel like I've heard more people um, who do actually, who are British, but just want an automatic car or the type of car they want is like more popular in an automatic transmission. But as a culture, if we're generalizing everything, it's still more common in the UK to drive a manual. If you rent a car in the UK, you need to make sure that they have automatic cars if you have never driven stick shift before. And there are kind of these uh, feuds between which one is best. My husband always says things like, manual transmissions are better for like turning sharp corners that they have in the UK, more, more control going around, going around roundabouts. Um, I, I've never noticed a huge difference in what it feels like in his car versus what it feels like in my 
automatic car when I used to drive it here. So I don't know, weigh in, comment down below. I read an article that said British, the British people do prefer and still drive manual cars and they think that they're better but actually they're not really that much better anymore because automatic cars have come a long way but it used to be true that they're better but everyone has kind of stuck with that so I, I, I definitely am not on board with I haven't learned how to drive stick shift here because I feel like I'm going to die every time I drive on the roads here anyway because I'm used to American roads, which we'll talk about in a second. But if you are an expat moving to the UK and that's something that interests you, you will definitely have no shortage of cars to purchase and practice on because they're mostly all manual. So moving along, talking about cars, let's talk about the roads. So. I feel like everyone who has seen an American movie knows that American roads are very wide, very spacious, just like most of America. We have big things and they need big roads to go on. Um, but one thing that people don't necessarily think about is the difference between UK and US highways, which is what we say in the US, they say motorways here. But if you think about how big America is and how kind of gridded it was designed, you can imagine that most of our highways are very, very straight. They're just straight into infinity. They're like all the way up the country, one straight line. It's where you get this idea of like a road trip being something that's super fun and you're just cruising along, don't even have to pay attention really, you've got your music playing and it's just like a good time. An American road trip, so much fun. Over in the UK, there's no room for endless straight roads. The motorways are basically like either circular or they're going to be curved. You're always going to be net. You're always going to be turning somewhere. You're always going to be having to pay attention. Some of the motorways that we've driven on, I swear they should be one lane that they've tried to turn into three. I could reach out with my arm and touch the car next to me. So I would say of the road trips I've been on in the UK, it's not really your quintessential road trip experience. It's very stressful for the driver and the passenger, me, who is worried that we're going to be hit by a lorry at any moment. Um, and you don't just kind of get to put on cruise control and just drive straight. It's a whole different ball game, a whole different layout. And that's just because there's not enough room for the American straight roads or the size of the roads that we have in the US. They're working with what they got, um, but it's definitely not a relaxing experience. And this is why I feel like British people feel like a couple of hours drive is like horrendous. It's like a whole day, like going an hour and a half somewhere is like, that's gotta be, you've gotta be staying there for a week in order to make it worth it. That's an exaggeration, but you know what I mean. Whereas in the US, I feel like we say, oh yeah, my friend just lives six hours away. So I'm going to go and visit today and come back the same day. I feel like the driving experience in general on the highways leads to this idea because it does feel like a long time when you're on a British motorway for two hours, as opposed to an American highway where the time just seems to fly because you've basically forgotten that you're driving. The next difference that I wrote down has to do with mailboxes or post boxes. So the first thing to note is when it comes to your actual home, in America, we typically, if we're living in the suburbs, have an actual mailbox at the end of our driveway because the mailman is driving around in his car um, or in his mail truck um, and he is going to open your mailbox from the road from his truck and put the mail in and then you go down your driveway to get your mail whenever. In the UK, they don't have mailboxes like that. They have uh, mail slots basically in the front doors and the mailman actually is called a postman here and he doesn't uh he drives to individual neighborhoods but he doesn't drive through the neighborhood because he has to actually go up to your front door to deliver it so they typically park in an area they've got their mail bag and they're actually like hand delivering through the mail slot in your front door so the mail literally ends up in your house which scares me every single time it happens and I'm home because the mail slot actually can make a pretty loud noise when it shuts, when he pushes the mail in. So I always think someone's breaking in. Um, 
And the second thing to note is about like the, the mailbox versus the post box when we're talking about somewhere that anyone can put a letter into. So obviously you're probably familiar with a UK post box, which is typically red and um, they're really all over. And that is for a couple of reasons, but one of them is you can't, that's like the only way besides going to a post office to actually send something out. Whereas in the US, you send something out by sticking it in your mailbox and putting the flag up, which lets the mailman know that he is going to take that mail that's to go out and replace it with any mail that you have in. So in the US, post or mailboxes, it's very hard to talk in American English and British English in my head at all times, but it's much more popular to, to have a mailbox, like a blue mailbox in the US in cities and built up areas where they don't have the kind of suburban looking mailboxes because then that is one of, that is how you would send your mail out. But here in the UK, there's no option besides a post box or going to the post office where in the US, we usually can send mail from our house in a lot of areas. Okay, so I'm gonna finish this video talking about something that everyone loves to talk about, which is taxes. So I may have mentioned this in a video before, but what I really wanted to point out in the differences between countries, it's not necessarily how we file our taxes, but what they do if you are not living in that country anymore, even though you are a citizen. So in the UK, if I was a UK citizen and had no other uh, citizenships, I, if I chose to live somewhere else in the world, I would pay taxes wherever else in the world I was a tax resident. And so I wouldn't pay UK taxes on my foreign earned income in the case that I was qualified as like a tax resident of another place and I was actually settled there and living there. In the US, no matter how far you go or for how long, if you are a citizen, they always will come after you for taxes. So I have to file taxes in the US every single year and I could live out of the country for 50 years and as long as I have American citizenship, then I am on the hook for at least filing taxes. Now there are certain countries that you can live in that have tax treaties. So the UK and the US have an agreement that an American living in the UK has to make, it's like $107,000 equivalent or something right now. But if I make under that, I still have to file, I still have to report, but I don't have to pay taxes to the US on it because I have already paid it in the UK. Once you start making over that, then you might be on the line for paying taxes doubly in the UK and in the US because America is always following you. I think the US is one of only two countries in the world that have this arrangement and uh, it's pretty annoying. Um, so that is something to be aware of if you are an American expat planning on moving somewhere else. Do not plan on stopping your tax filing because it could come back to haunt you. Okay, so that brings me to the end of this video. I hope you guys enjoyed some more differences between the UK and the US. If you have any other video topics, ideas, or differences, definitely comment them down below and I'll see you guys next time.